Great. Uh, thanks, Stephen. And thanks to all the speakers. Um, my name is Eli Weinstein, and I'm a postdoc with They Fly at, at Columbia. Um, and it's my pleasure to, to introduce uh, the next speaker. Um, uh, Professor Poonin Lee is the Eugene Bell Career Development Professor of Tissue Engineering at MIT and a core member of the Whitehead Institute. She received her PhD in chemical biology from Harvard in 2012 and then was an American Cancer Society postdoctoral fellow working with Michael Elowitz um, at Caltech uh, before joining MIT. Um, Professor Lee is a pioneer in the emerging field of synthetic and developmental biology and is perhaps best known for her work unraveling and re-engineering communication codes in developmental signaling pathways. She's received many awards, including the NIH Pathway to Independence and New Innovator, Innovator Awards, the Santa Cruz Developmental Biology Young Investigator Award, and the R.R. Bensley Award in Cell Biology. Uh, we're thrilled to welcome her here to the LMRL workshop um, and to start thinking about the intersection of synthetic developmental biology uh, and machine learning. And so without further ado, um, uh, Professor Lee. All right, thank you, Eli. Uh, just want to make sure you can't can you see my slides. Okay. Great, thank you. Yeah, and uh, really thanks uh, to the or, uh, organizers of this fantastic workshop. You know, when I got an invitation, I was surprised because I don't work on machine learning. <laughs> we don't really develop uh, algorithms, uh, but I'm really excited to see the developments in this really, you know, uh, bur burgeoning field. Uh, and clearly, since I started my lab at Whitehead uh, three years ago, we have also adopted some of these fantastic algorithms developed uh, by various uh, talented people to really understand cell-cell communication. And also, as the previous speaker pointed out, you know, um, lots of us are interested in multicellular system to understand how and why cells are organized in a specific way. So today for my talk, I'll take you to a slightly smaller scale. Instead of looking at the entire transcriptomics and many, many different cell types, I will direct your attention to a much smaller subset of uh, genetic interactions and really trying to use synthetic biology and mathematical modeling to understand what these genetic circuits are capable of doing and why are they evolved and enriched in as some of the common motifs um, in developmental biology. Okay, so let's see. Um, as we all know, <laughs> oh, in, in our, oh, we all develop from a single fertilized egg and these cells uh, rapidly divide, uh, increase in numbers, and eventually they become uh, hundreds or maybe thousands of different cell types that make our human body. But we also know our body is not just a bag of randomly mixed cells, right? Um, and we know the, these different cell types form these beautiful, beautiful, intricate spatial patterns. And the way they interact with each other is intimately linked to the organ function. Um, so one fundamental question in developmental biology or tissue biology is how do cells know where they should be, right? Uh, and related to that is how do cells actually use these evolutionarily conserved components or genes to build organs or organisms of varying shapes and sizes and patterns? And answering this question, you know, as, as a biologist, <laughs> this is one of the most fascinating biological question of that say, in developmental biology, but it's also really important for understanding many other uh, multicellular tissue level questions uh, in related to um, phenomena such as regeneration, inflammation, and also as the previous speaker pointed out, like tumor microenvironments. So what is determined these sort of spatial pattern? I would say fundamentally, this relies on cell-cell communication, right? Um, and this is a just very simple illustration of what we think about cell-cell communication. Like the cell on the left-hand side secrete a blue ligand binds to a receptor uh, on the right-hand side of the cell, and vice versa, the other cell can secrete a different ligand uh, and act on the first cell. Then th with the explosion of a uh, large scale sequencing data set. Now there's so many algorithms out there to uh, predict uh, th this relationship of cell-cell communication, right? And fundamentally, we often take these single cell RNA-seq data, then take the count matrix and uh, pass this through some scoring function based on the ligand receptor interactions and to infer the cell-cell communication circuit. And I think this is really, uh, 
very important first step to allow us to map out the relationship uh, among all these different cell types and really open our eyes uh, to this wild new world. Um, but I have to say, cell-cell communication is way more complex than just the ligand receptor interaction, right? For example, we know lots of the um, cell-cell communication signaling molecules have a very delicate uh, spatial distribution, right? They're often secreted, for example, by a localized source and they'll diffuse in the multicellular space and to form some sort of concentration gradient. And the cells will interpret this concentration gradient differently, depends on where they are uh, within the tissue. Um, so they will generate different, maybe continuous uh, gene expression space, or maybe even make discrete cell state switching. And not only this type of information uh, is quantitative, but also communication is not a one-way street, right? This, when the cells receive this signaling information, it can trigger feedback circuits uh, in the receiving cells and to further modify the spatial distribution of the information. Um, the feedback can be positive feedback, can be negative feedback, can be mix of both that can have different time delays, which really creates this rich multicellular behavior. And one of the famous example uh, like proposed is actually we're all familiar with is by the mathematic mathematician Alan Turing. Uh, more than half a century ago, he proposed this really famous model in which if you have an activator and an inhibitor in the system, and then they form this kind of exactly this type of uh, feedback loops. And this simple two-component system would allow a, a initially uniform system to, uh, to have really intricate patterns that emerge, such as this polka dot patterns or Labrinx patterns, really de depends on the specific parameter regime the system is in. So I think this just demonstrates, you know, we can take this simple ligand receptor interaction one step further to understand if the, there's some simple uh, feedback loops uh, uh, wired in our genome, and that could already generate some very non-intuitive and fascinating behavior at the multicellular level. So the question that really drive my lab is, how can we understand and better predict the functional capability of these communication circuits, right? Not just which cell interact with with what what other cell, but also why they in uh, like why the uh, communication circuits is involved in certain ways. And uh, for the rest of my talk, again, I'm just gonna focus on one important uh, phenomenon or module of multicellular communication, uh, which is the morphogen gradients. Right. So what is morphogen gradients? Um, basically, they are secreted signaling ligands uh, that are often used in the developmental system. Uh, and just like you know, cytokines or chemokines, they're secreted by a localized source and it forms ligand gradient in space. And then the receiving cells would uh, turn on the signaling response to have a spatially graded uh, signal response in the tissue as well. And then the further downstream in the gene regulatory network, uh, the cells would try to interpret these quantitative information uh, and make discrete cell fit decisions, right? We often call this is the French flag model, which just means, you know, the cells at different positions would, would take on different cell fates. So this model is quite simple, uh, but this simple model, however, is not sufficient to explain some quite common uh, biological phenomenon that geneticists have observed over and, and over again. For example, I just gave you a very, you know, quantitative picture of how morphogen gradient works, right? It's a very, uh, cells have to precisely interpret the exact amount of ligand they're exposed to and make self a decision. And by this logic, you would imagine if an animal has a mutation in a morphogen gene, for example, lose one copy of the, uh, the two alleles, then that would reduce the morphogen uh, ligand by half. So you would expect the, the animal should have totally screwed up uh, spatial patterning, right? And they should not be able to survive. However, uh, in many, many of the morphogen pathways, we have found um, heterozygous mutant mice or human, they're totally normal. For example, this is uh, 
uh, were very important morphogen uh, pathway that I'm, I'm actually going to focus on for the rest of my talk. It's called the sonic hedgehog. It's important for the patterning of our central nervous system, determine the number of fingers we have in, in our hands. Um, but heterozygous sonic hedgehog uh, uh, mice and human can survive totally uh, normal. So how does biological system build in this kind of robustness mechanism against morphogen dosage to ensure um, a reproducible patterning process? And uh, develop, not only this development of bio, uh, developmental system needs to be um, robust, robust, but we know the same uh, motif or the same morphogens are being used to pattern tissues of very different sizes and within very different time scales. Uh, for example, hedgehog again is used by uh, fruit flies to pattern the wing. And in this case, it only forms a, a gradient about 30 micron. But when you look at um, the same gradient in, in mice, um, it's when it's used for patterning our central nervous system, it can um, expand into 100 micron. And when we think about some tissue that's even larger, like our uh, bones, it can go up even to 300 micron. So this is actually not a very trivial question um, because we know forming a, a morphogen gradient or diffusion, it doesn't scale linearly with the size. So if you, you want to pattern a field that's 10 times larger, then you actually need a um, hundred times more of the time unit uh, to accomplish this goal, right? So how does evolution actually tune um, the morphogen gradient to match uh, the, the size and the speed uh, of the uh, particular developing tissue? That's something that's where it's really poorly understood. And finally, uh, just to make the size question even more uh, interesting, um, there is a phenomenon called scaling. So what is scaling? Um, there's this classic embryology experiment where if you take a frog embryo and you cut into half at a certain stage at a certain you know, uh, dimension, each half of the uh, um, uh, egg can actually develop into a, a tadpole. It's just smaller, but if you measure the head to tail ratio, it's proportional to each other, uh, just as the wild type, uh, full size typo. So how how do how does biological system of multicellular tissue can actually scale uh, all these organs proportionally? And if you think about what the morphogen gradient uh, model, it's actually not obvious, right? Because for a larger embryo or a larger tissue, you'll have a normal sized morphogen gradient. And you would imagine if you have a smaller embryo, you might just cut off the tail end of the uh, of a normal uh, uh, of the gradient, and as a result, you would, for example, lose entirely uh, the the red cell type. But in this case, um, it's actually you're not losing any cell type. In fact, you rescale the gradient. Uh, proportionally to the size of the tissue so that you still have a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio among the blue, white, and red cells. So this cannot be explained by the simple morphogen uh, gradient um, uh, model. So my lab is, are intrigued, is intrigued by these kind of observation to ask what additional uh, components were missing uh, that's beyond just the ligand receptor interactions uh, in these uh, biological systems. So to study these questions, it's actually it's not really easy to do uh, in the uh, uh, developing embryo using traditional genetics. So then this, this is something I um, developed when I was a postdoc at Caltech uh, in Michael Alois lab. We decided instead of uh, you know, breaking a real, uh, about natural biological system, we want to build new biological system from the bottom up. So we decided to reconstitute morphogen gradients uh, in the petri dish. Uh, how do we do that? So we took mouse uh, fibroblast cells called NIH3T3, and we used genetic engineering methods uh, to engineer these 3T3 cells into signaling sending and signaling receiving cells. So the, the sender cells has inducible uh, system. It can be induced by 4-HT, which is a drug, uh, to produce uh, the hedge, sonic hedgehog morphogen. And the receiver cells, uh, we just put in a fluorescent transcriptional reporter uh, in these cells uh, that uh, drive the expression of uh, a yellow fluorescent protein 
So then the center is also constitutively expressed a blue fluorescent protein. So we ask if we just mix these senders and receivers to, together in a petri dish, can they communicate, right? Um, can they, the second level of question is, can they actually form this concentration gradient uh, in a dish? So the first experiment we did is just to randomly mix the senders and the receiver cells. So you have individually isolated blue sender as island and surrounded by confluently cultured uh, receiver cells. And to our surprise, actually, I guess we had very low expectation. Um, so the, we were able to see really uh, uh, like beautiful gradient formation uh, in this petri dish. And it's just like a little fireworks in the, in the petri dish. And we could just like uh, watch this over and over again under a microscope. And uh, uh, we're excited about this result. So we ask, well, can we also reconstitute this uh, gradient in different geometry to represent you know, different tissue contacts? Uh, so the second experiment we did is to use a, a little bit more, more, slightly more sophisticated cell patterning technique to plate uh, the center cells as a stripe in the middle of the dish and the receiver cells on the rest of the dish. This way you can form a quasi-linear boundary between the blue and the yellow cells. And again, we're able to see um, like beautiful gradient formation. And this really allow us to um, quantitatively measure these spatial temporal dynamics of the gradients. But most importantly, because we're using these fibroblast cells, uh, we call them blank slate cells because they don't really change their cell fates uh, as they receive the signal um, and they stay where they are. And they're also very easy for genetic engineering. So we can take apart these signaling pathways and reconstitute them with different feedback circuits, right, to test different hypotheses. So using this system, we decide to ask the first question, uh, to, uh, like what is the mechanism for robustness in these uh, gradient system? Um, and long story short, um, so we ended up uh, looking at a very uh, evolutionarily conserved negative feedback loop in the hedgehog pathway. So hedgehog pathway, to understand the negative feedback loop, we first need to understand how the pathway works. It's a little bit, counterintuitive pathway in a sense, you know, in most of the pathways we know when the ligands bind to, re to the receptor, the receptor would re recruit secondary messengers and to induce signal. But hedgehog pathway has the reverse logic. So um, in the absence of the ligand, the receptor called patched sits on the membrane and it suppresses the signal inside the cells. But when the ligand binds to the receptor, so it will form a ligand receptor complex and it'll get internalized. And this is a way for removing this inhibition. And as a result, uh, the signal gets activated. But in all of the hedgehog system, there's an evolution conserved feedback, meaning when a signal is activated, cells would try to upregulate the expression of the patch receptor uh, to shut down the signal, basically. So we know negative feedback loop uh, from systems biology that in general, uh, it can provide some sort of buffering mechanism right, against uh, var variability in gene expression. So then we ask, is it possible that this uh, evolutionary conserved feedback loop provides some sort of robustness to the system? And uh, first, before we do more complex uh, genetic engineering to the cells, which takes a long time, <laughs> we decided first to computationally uh, test our hypothesis. So we construct mathematical models, very simple mathematical models uh, to simulate these two different scenarios. Uh, on the left-hand side, we call it open loop, meaning the system doesn't have any neck to feedback loop. Um, it's just the ligand bind to the receptor and regulate an intracellular uh, transcription factor called GLE and which uh, directly regulate uh, the signaling reporter. And on the uh, right-hand side, uh, we just added one additional interaction and one just one extra parameter. Uh, in this case, we have the same transcription factor um, regulate uh, the expression of the receptor itself, right? So it's very simple and uh, we build um, uh, cell lines with the open loop uh, configuration so that we can fit the simple mo mathematical model uh, to the experimentally measured data and then come back to predict what is gonna happen uh, when you have this uh, negative feedback loop. So 
uh, to compare the behavior of the negative the, these two pathway configurations, uh, we need to uh, devise just two um, uh, metrics to measure uh, the, rob the robustness of the gradient. Um, one is the amplitude of the gradient, uh, which is just basically uh, the highest signaling activity uh, closest to the source. And the second uh, metric is the length scale. Uh, length scale just measures uh, the, uh, the position at which the gradient drops to one over E uh, of the amplitude, right? So with these uh, two um, metrics, we can sort of have a general idea of the you know, quantitative uh, profile of the gradient. So then we ask, you know, uh, if we tune um, the morphogen dosage, right? Like, for example, to mimic the hydrozygous uh, mutant or the uh, what versus wild type, if we change this uh, dosage of the uh, uh, morphogen, um, how does that affect the amplitude and length scale? And clearly, with no feedback in the simple linear pathway architecture, um, the great the amplitude and length scale change dramatically when we increase the uh, morphogen dosage by twofold uh, each um, between uh, each adjacent data point. But if we add this patch negative feedback loop into the system, and now this change has become dramatically diminished, right? So this uh, suggests uh, the this negative feedback loop provides some robustness mechanism uh, against the variability uh, of the uh, gene dosage. So, you know, model is model, <laughs> right? For, we're experimentalists who really want to test, is this true uh, in an experimental system? Uh, so we decided, we took advantage again uh, of this uh, synthetic system. So we re-engineer uh, the, the cell line. Basically, we knock out the endogenous receptor and put in the synthetic uh, negative feedback loop, uh, which I'm not going to go get into the details. But uh, effectively, we have a single cell line. And uh, we can switch on or off this negative feedback loop by a second drug called doxycycline. So uh, in this case, if we don't add any doxycycline, the cell line uh, is in this open loop configuration. And so then we can uh, tune up uh, the dosage of the morphogen uh, gene uh, and, uh, and ask and measure the changes in both the amplitude and length scale. And clearly, um, just as model predicted, this is very sensitive uh, to gene dosage. But if we add doxycycline, which means we can turn on this negative feedback loop and under the exact same condition, and we saw the system becomes more resistant to the gene dosage, right? So the amplitude and length scale become more robust. So this just sort of a toy model, we published this and uh, it, it inspired us to ask even more question about, you know, different types of negative feedback loops, right? So because at the beginning I told you this pathway is really strange. <laughs> so uh, the disconnective feedback loop, but right up regulating the receptor, it actually makes it a bifunctional negative feedback loop. So what do I mean by bifunctional? Because this is receptor, so it can interact with the ligand, right? The more receptor you have, the more ligand the cell would be able to sequester. So the one function of this negative feedback loop is to reshape the distribution of the ligand in the extracellular space. But at the same time, the receptor can also modulate uh, the intracellular signal, especially if it's not bound to the ligand, it will suppress the signal, right? So it's basically one protein that can potentially execute these two functions. And we know negative feedback loops are very prevalent in all of the signaling pathways, right? From developmental morphogen pathways to cytokines, and chemokines. Um, so then they're generally fall into one of the, you know, a few categories, either modulating intracellular signal or modulating the extracellular ligand distribution. So we want to ask a more general question, right? Why, why, why does this path, why, why is this uh, bifunctional uh, negative feedback loop enriched uh, in, uh, in, during evolution? And what if you only have one function or the other? Um, can it provide the capability of robustness? So, uh, so one way to break down this uh, bifunctional feedback loop is just to say, well, let's simulate 
um, a different negative feedback loop, for example, the top one, uh, the signal would upregulate an extracellular uh, inhibitor only, so it provides only the extracellular function, or it, uh, the signal induce this orange protein, which is uh, in, inside the cells, so that would only suppress the signal uh, inside the cells. Um, what's the difference, right? And then also, if you want to think about some more complex scenario in which a single pathway might regulate, upregulate multiple negative feedback loops, for example, both the green and orange, right? So effectively, you would think, well, this should be equivalent to upregulating just the patch receptor itself. So when we did a simulation, and again, we didn't introduce any new parameters. We used exactly the same parameters as, as what we simulated before, just slightly changing the equations uh, to, to um, represent what these proteins can do. And this is what we found. And we are kind of surprised because um, what we found is the extracellular feedback loop can only uh, provide the length scale robustness, which is the green line. Uh, and the intracellular feedback loop, which is the orange line, can only provide amplitude robustness, which actually I think these two makes a lot of sense uh, because, you know, the land scale is mostly uh, regulated uh, by the, the ligand distribution across many cells, while the extracellular feedback sits on the surface of cells, right? Uh, it accumulates the effect um, as you go further away from the source. Uh, and similarly, intracellular feedback, the most strongest effect would be in the cells closest to the source where they upregulate the most of the, uh, these inhibitors. Uh, but what surprised us is that when you combine these two feedback loops together um, uh, as two separate proteins, it actually the uncoupled uh, feedback, the brown line, doesn't actually perform as well as this patched negative feedback loop. And in fact, it performs more like an intracellular feedback loop only. So then we, uh, we scratch our head, like, why is this case, right? And in the end, I think I just gave you a sort of an intuition of why this happens. Um, this is because when the two feedback loops are coupled uh, as uh, on the top um, diagram, uh, when the signal uh, upregulates more of these patch receptor, and the patch receptor can, this negative feedback loop can be removed by binding to the ligand. So then the cells can adjust uh, the amount of negative feedback loop uh, just based on the available ligand outside the cells. Uh, this way, it provides a sort of a dynamic tuning um, mechanism uh, to uh, change the amount of this negative regulator. Uh, versus on the, if you have these two functions uncoupled, so you have green and orange proteins. Now, what would happen when the signal gets activated, it will produce both the green and orange protein, but quickly, even though the green proteins can be removed from the cell surface, the orange proteins will accumulate in the cells. And to the extent that when it, it will quickly um, stop the signal inside the cells, so uh, then the cells won't be able to trigger any more negative feedback loop. So this is a very static, uh, very sort of rigid regulation uh, of these negative regulators. So, um, Okay, so I hope uh, this this part of the uh, story um, give you a general sense of what we can do um, with this type of bottom up approach and how uh, by combining this uh, mathematical model and genetic engineering, we're really able to understand uh, sort of functional differences among seemingly equivalent negative feedback loops. Um, and uh, for the rest of my talk, I'm gonna focus on some uh, something slightly new that's been uh, we've been working on in my own lab here uh, at Whitehead, which is uh, both to understand how this um, cell, the distance of cell-cell communication can be tuned uh, by uh, extracellular modulators and also the question of scaling. So I already introduced you the, to this question tuna, about tunability during evolution. Uh, and uh, this work I'm going to talk about is mostly done um, by a very talented postdoc, Gavin Schliesel, and um, a, a graduate student, Mira Mezin. So they're intrigued uh, by the versatility of these morphogen ligands. And it's especially, uh, we're actually quite puzzled by this observation uh, that hedgehog secreted uh, hedgehog 
it's not just a, a, a you know a soluble protein it actually uh, modified by two lipids on the protein um one is a cholesterol one is a palmitic acid so the lipids are important for the signaling activity of sonic hedgehog, but it also creates this conundrum of how do you have this hydrophobic tails while still, you know, uh, be able to form a very long range uh, morphogen gradient, right? And it seems very counterintuitive. And we got inspired by actually some animal genetics. Uh, in this case, um, there are multiple pieces of evidence uh, lining up. But uh, in this case, uh, I'm showing you is a genetic mutant uh, called Scoop3. Uh, and in these, in these mutants, uh, the mice can uh, sur survive, um, but they just have very short uh, statue and short limbs. Um, this kind of is consistent with the function of hedgehog in um, regulating a bone development and bone lands. So we decided uh, to follow up on this uh, scoop family proteins. They are very interesting family proteins. They are actually secreted extracellular matrix protein. Um, so, um, and interestingly, uh, they're really unique. Uh, to the chordates, right? If we, we look at the Drosophila genome, you can't find a scoop protein. But in chordates, we actually have an expansion uh, of these proteins. Like in human, we have three of them uh, distributed in different tissues. Uh, and we made a scoop protein uh, in, in our cultured cells and just applied the scoop protein to the R gradient formation assay and we, to our uh, excitement, we saw uh, the scoop protein actually dramatically expand the size of this morphogen gradient and in a very concentration dependent manner. So then how does scoop expand hedgehog gradient, right? So uh, this is alpha four predict the scoop structure. It's a multi-domain extracellular protein. And I think uh, importantly, the take home message is uh, the scoop protein has this extracellular domain called cup domain that can specifically bind to the cholesterol as a result because you uh, hide this hydrophobic tail of the protein, you can solubilize a hedgehog and make it go further um, in the extracellular space. So um, not only they make the grading go further, uh, we, we saw the scoop protein actually really make uh, the diffusion happens uh, in the in extracellular space. For example, here uh, we labeled all the uh, center cells in blue, and not only the nuclei, you can also see uh, the cytoplasm and the membrane of all these the, the cluster of uh, blue sending cells. And at the same time, you also see these uh, receiving cell uh, receiver cells where all their membrane are labeled uh, in red. So if I'm playing you a video here, you'll see uh, the blue cells and the red cells. They never touch each other, right? Never get, get into physical contact. Uh, but nevertheless, um, the uh, red cells can be activated uh, by the blue cells. Uh, this is cross about uh, 150 to 200 micron. So this is really sort of a, a direct evidence showing scoop can really uh, make the hedgehog diffuse further. Uh, and we really want to be able to see hedgehog uh, in, in this case. So uh, taking advantage of this simple cell culture system where we can actually do some really fancy uh, imaging, uh, Gavin, uh, through lots of trial and error, uh, he was able to tag the hedgehog protein uh, with a fluorescent tag called the halo tag. So this is actually not easy because lots of the signaling ligands are very small. Like, you know, some of the chemokines are only 10 kilodalton. Hedgehog is only um, uh, 19 kilodalton. And it's very compact. It interacts with lots of different proteins outside the cells. So we have to be very careful in terms of where we put this halo tag. But Gavin was able to figure that out. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, uh, and he uh, used um, a cell non permeable dye to specifically label the hedgehog. And then, in collaboration with Andrew Hansen's lab at MIT, here, uh, we perform a single particle tracking uh, in, the, in the system, in the gradient information system. And we're shocked to, to be able to see, you know, uh, these. A uh, jittering movement of an individual uh, hedgehog particle uh, as they are forming uh, these spatial morphogen gradient. It's a really beautiful system, and I feel like I can just sit here watching them moving around <laughs> all the time. Uh, so on the left hand, I'll play the video again. 
um, is a hedgehog alone uh, without any uh, scoop. And you can see this sort of brown emotion. Uh, but on the right hand side, we actually added 5% uh, of the protein scoop to the system. And now you see the single particle start to explore much larger space uh, in, the, in the cell culture system. And uh, Gavin overlaid uh, thousands of these trajectories under different conditions. And as you could see, again, uh, scoop makes a uh, hedgehog explore a much larger uh, distance uh, in this uh, space. So I think putting all this data together, um, I'll just give you a general model about how Scoob actually um, expand hedgehog gradient, right? The one function for Scoob here shows as the uh, the pink protein is to uh, re help the release of hedgehog from the uh, sender membrane because hedgehog itself is very hydrophobic, but by binding to Scoob, it reduces its affinity for the membrane so it can quickly go into a soluble state. And then the second uh, function of Scoop is uh, the, it binds to hedgehog and allows it to explore uh, a much larger space and increases diffusion rate. And therefore, you can generate a much longer uh, gradient uh, in the tissue. Um, so I think this just tells us uh, sort of a one lesson, which is, again, ligand receptor interaction itself is not uh, enough to predict which cell uh, can interact or can, can communicate with which other cell, right? Because the actual cellular modulators of these signaling pathways, they are really prevalent in almost every single pathways. And then they can control the distance, control the timing and for the cell-cell uh, communication. And then unfortunately, <laughs> I feel Unlike ligand and receptor, although ligand receptor interactions are already hard enough to predict, mm -hmm. these extracellular modulators just creates another layer of complexity, and we really don't have very much quantitative data in terms of pre predicting, uh, no, the exact effect of these modulators uh, in regulating the distance of cell-cell communication. But I think this also creates an opportunity for or, or necessity for making more of these biophysical measurements so that we can uh, build these parameters into our um, prediction algorithm to uh, be able to better predict cell-cell communication based on gene expression. And the last part is actually built upon what I just told you about the function of Scoop. And then to tell you a very short story in collaboration with Sean Magson's lab at Harvard about how this protein actually can help with this phenomenon called scaling. Um, so Sean's lab is a zipperfish lab. They study um, the development of many different organs in, in that zipper, beautiful zipperfish system. And, uh, they put out this uh, bio archive paper a few years ago in which they were able to bisect a zebrafish embryo, just like what people did with the, the frog embryo and cut into half. So, uh, but each half of the zebrafish embryo can develop into a, a larval fish. And then when they measure the hedgehog gradient in the smaller fish or the bigger fish, and they found that the gradient actually can scale perfectly. So the, the plot on the bottom just shows a rescale, like the, the grade, normalized the gradient um, ba based on the size uh, of the, uh, the tissue. So uh, the size reduced embryo, oh, which is the orange one, if you div um, normalize the gradient based on the size of the embryo, it completely overlaps, overlaps with the blue one. This is example of perfect scaling, right? Because you want the gradient to scale proportionally with the tissue size. But the question is, how does this pathway, uh, how does gradient get uh, scaled? Uh, so through some genetic uh, analysis, Xiang's lab discovered that um, the hedgehog actually regulates the scoop gene expression. So previously I told you scoop can expand the hedgehog gradient, right? So that's what this positive arrow represents. But Xiang's lab found uh, in a, a gradient field, hedgehog, when the cell receives hedgehog signal, it actually uh, suppress or shut off scoop expression. Um, so as a result, you have this two counter gradient. So hedgehog comes from the left-hand side and scoop comes from uh, the right-hand side. And we want to ask whether this simple circuit 
can generate this scaling behavior, right? This is sort of inspired by the earlier work uh, done by Narma Bakai's lab uh, at Weizmann Institute. Uh, they look at the scaling behavior comprehensively and propose some um, uh, theoretical model. And so we build our model upon their model um, and ask if we incorporate the hedgehog scoop interaction, um, including the release rate and the diffusion rate, is this sufficient to generate a perfectly scaled uh, gradient? And this work was done by a really talented MIT physics undergrad, Albert Chin, who worked with me uh, last year uh, to, uh, to model this process. And uh, I'm not gonna go into the nitty gritty details of this mathematical model, but what Albert asked is just given this uh, node reaction diffusion system, and what if we shrink the patterning size from say from 300 micron to 200 micron, right? Can we oh, generate re, uh, this rescaled gradient? And to measure this uh, scaling phenomenon, we uh, devise this metric called the, the goodness of scaling. Uh, basically, it means here, if you have uh, the blue uh, value, it means it's a perfect, perfectly scaled gradient. And the red means we're, we're scaling, okay? And then we ask, uh, because the, the scoop can change the hedgehog gradient with these two per particular parameters, one is the release rate, the other one is diffusion rate. We ask, are both functions necessary and which one contributes more to the scaling? Uh, again, if neither uh, parameters get changed by scoop, you get pretty terrible scaling. But if you only change the release rate, meaning when you have more scoop, you have more um, hedgehog getting uh, delivered into the uh, receiver cell field, it doesn't get you very uh, much further uh, for scaling. And similarly, if you only say, well, scoop changed the diffusion rate of, of hedgehog, it also doesn't really give you scaling. But when you combine these two parameters together at a certain ratio, uh, what we saw is um, the system can actually accomplish a perfect scaling, which is shown in this uh, diagonal dark blue region. So uh, again, this model of sort of was able to, even though it's simple, it was sufficient uh, to explain uh, this uh, scaling behavior. And uh, uh, because lots of the, we can't measure lots of the uh, parameters directly. So instead, uh, Albert did a very uh, comprehensive uh, parameter um, uh, scanning and uh, similar, just to make sure our observation is not completely dependent on the particular parameter combinations we're looking at. And uh, the, his results again shows you really require, across many parameter combinations, uh, you really require uh, the increase in both the diffusion rate and also the release rate to generate this perfect scaling. Um, so how does this work? Um, here is just showing you in a smaller embryo, uh, you have hedgehog release from the left, a scoop release from the right, and then scoop modulates the hedgehog gradient. Uh, so uh, in a larger field, you're gonna have more uh, scoop expressing cells. Uh, and if, you, if scoop only modulate the release, what you would see is you're gonna have a tons of hedgehog piled up close to the source. So this would give you a much higher amplitude, but it's not gonna give you a longer or a proportionally scaled gradient. But, but if you change both the release and diffusion rate, now these uh, scoop um, protein can shuttle these extra hedgehog to a further distance. And because of this feedback loop, um, the amount of scoop can be tuned by the amount of hedgehog, so you can actually generate a proportionally a scaled gradient. So this is just a very simple uh, intuition. It's not extremely mathematically accurate, um, but we're excited to see you know, when the simple model can explain such complex uh, non-intuitive biological behaviors. So in summary, um, uh, like, we really focus a very uh, primarily on the hedgehog pathway on a very small set of uh, genetic circuits. But I hope I convince you that 
uh, even though these, despite this reductionism approach, we're able to at least partially explain some interesting biological phenomenon, such as this evolutionary conserved bifunctional feedback loop can provide robustness to the system. And uh, during evolution, even though we think uh, hydrogel pathway is highly conserved, but the evolution of new protein modulators can uh, tune the size and speed of gradient formation. And furthermore, when you evolve a new protein, over time, this new protein or new gene can be rewired into the existing gene regulatory network to form additional feedback loop. And these new circuits uh, gave the system even more interesting behavior, such as scaling, maintaining the proportion. Um, so this is one area that we've been working on in the lab, uh, still extending sort of the morphogen gradient to look at broadly different signaling pathways, different modulators, and different uh, circuits. Um, and we are really trying to uh, ask so maybe a slightly harder question is, how many of these <laughs> feedback loops exist and the modulators exist in the natural system, right? And if you take all these single cell RNA-seq data, um, can we identify new modulators or uh, new feedback loops based on the, the gene expression or, or correlation, right? I think the spatial transcriptomics uh, data is also really exciting, uh, like complementary to the single cell data, because then we can further infer uh, some of these uh, circuit interactions between, for example, two or three distinct cell types uh, to see if there's any enriched motifs here. And Wes, but there's still a lot of work to do. And I think some of you can do a much better job than what we can do uh, <laughs> by playing with the data. And uh, I think what we're good at is once we have these predictions, we can take these tissues and make quantitative measurements and, uh, and build mathematical models to ask what these uh, circuits can do in the system. And I think the most fun part is to be able to reconstitute uh, these multicellular interactions uh, in a petri dish and perturb them and then test uh, our um, both the uh, prediction based on the data and also the mathematical models. Um, so this is my last slide. I just want to really acknowledge uh, the people who have the done the amazing job um, pushing these projects forward. I think I was really lucky to be able to build a very, uh, you know, uh, exciting lab. Uh, it's the best part is going to the lab every day to talk to people. Uh, and Gavin, as a postdoc, Miriam's uh, the graduate student, and Albert is the, the undergrads. And I also want to thank our collaborators, um, Anders Hansen's lab and his uh, his graduate student, Dominique um, uh, and uh, Anchor Jane at Whitehead for helping us with the single particle tracking. And also the really interesting, exciting uh, collaboration with Sean Maxson's lab and his graduate student, Anna, on the scaling project. And uh, finally, uh, our finding, funding sources. And uh, thanks again for your attention. I know my topic is quite distant from what you do, but I hope uh, this, uh, you know, uh, it's just as a start of some interesting conversations and collaborations to see how we can merge the large data analysis with something bottom up and experimental. And uh, yeah, with that, I'd, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. All right. Thank you so much for that beautiful talk. Uh, that was really wonderful and inspiring. Um, while we're waiting for people to ask questions in the uh, Q&A, which you can find at the bottom of the Zoom screen, um, I was hoping to uh, maybe have a brief discussion about uh, um, what you see as future interactions between machine learning and, and developmental biology and synthetic developmental biology and, and what you might envision for the future. Um, at the end, you talked about this problem of going from uh, large scale data sets to a mechanistic understanding and then to predictions for or designs for synthetic um, systems. Um, uh, could you explain a little bit more about how you might envision that process? What are some of the data sets that are available out there people might want to look at and what are the sorts of models they might want to uh, try and start building um, based on that data? Yeah, I mean, that's something we constantly discuss in the lab. As you can tell, many of these circuits or the regulators we studied um, 
are really pulled out from these conventional, you know, uh, animal genetic studies, right? But I feel one uh, uh, revenue here is these uh, accumulating, like exploding data set can potentially allow us to speed up this discovery process uh, where, you know, maybe uh, by be better inferring, um, you know, cell-cell uh, communication, signal activation, right, and correlation between signal activation and these uh, conserved feedback or, or modulators, that would allow us to better map uh, or at least pre narrow down the set of feedback loops that's worth studying uh, in the experimental system, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it definitely does. I, I'm, I'm curious, I mean, so you, you've mentioned spatial transcriptomics as a data set of interest, and we, we've already heard a lot about that, and, and I know a lot of people are very excited about it, but, you know, you, you've just presented this beautiful developmental story about where almost everything is happening at the protein level. Um, <laughs> you know, almost nothing was, was RNA level. It was all proteins diffusing, which is exactly the sort of thing that it's hard to detect uh, using spatial transcriptomics. Um, yeah. What... What sorts of high throughput technologies are you excited about, or where, where do you think people should look to 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 find or to build um, data sets that uh, might might actually be able to teach you something about morphogens? Um, yeah, I I see. No, we also discussed debating a lot whether the RNA expression truly represents the protein in <laughs> expression. Um, but you know. Frankly speaking, it is really, really hard to detect these extracellular ligands in the tissue, right? Just because, you know, they're very potent. They often exist in nanomolar range. Even when we do like, you know, antibody staining or like some even luciferase labeling, it's just really hard to quantify them. I, I think maybe some really smart people working on spatial proteomics, they will have a better idea how to solve this problem. But I think it's going to be challenging, right? So uh, I, I don't feel... It's fair to to say, you know, RNA is not going to teach us anything. We really have to go to the protein level, right? Like lots of the in the, the way we measure morphogen gradient is initially the simplest way is to actually build a transcriptional reporter in the receiver cells and use that as a proxy for how far these morphogen can can diffuse, right? So I could imagine similarly, you you can use transcriptional profiles to to predict that. But the, the question is, which genes you're going to look at? <laughs> right? uh, and so, so yeah, so that's something that, you know, keeps us awake at night. But uh, I, I think for people who work with spatial transatomics and single cell RNA-seq with, especially data set where you have precise perturbations, you know what signal you're activating or inhibiting, perhaps that'll give you a better indication of uh, how to measure uh, the signal response gradient. Very cool. So um, uh, on the modeling side, you, you've presented a number of beautiful models to explain your data. I was wondering if you could explain um, a little bit more about uh, the details of those models. Oh, yeah. um, and, and so mathematically, I assume they're uh, differential equation based yes. models. And you've got some kind certainly, of- certainly. Uh, uh, Michaelis Menten kinetics or something like that. Totally, yeah. Uh, sorry, I I gloss over the the details of the model because I wasn't sure who are who are in the audience. Uh, sometimes we're I, I think this audience is ready for the math. Yeah. Okay, great, awesome. I'll find my group. Okay, so uh, for example, this is the model we published for the the patch feedback loop. Uh, it's a, it's a coupled PDE model. Uh, so the diffusion part is the hedgehog. Right. So in, in the equation, we just have a diffusion term, and we do have the mechanism momentum, which is the, the ligand receptor binding as a reversible process. Right. So association, dissociation. So that's that's the extracellular part, and then the rest of the intracellular part, like the receptor, the treasury factor, and signal reporter, that's just a bunch of ODE models, like where each each uh, a variable has a production term, a degradation term, and if it binds to ligand, it also has association and dissociation rates. Yeah. Okay. So if we were to imagine uh, a machine learning method on spatial transcriptomic or other types of data that might be informative for your types of experiments, we should maybe be imagining something like a large 
um, ODE model that we could potentially train or do inference on. I know there's been a lot of recent advances in methodology for, for learning the, these, these types of models. Um, and, and that might give uh, uh, mechanistic predictions for um, uh, uh, of the kind that you're interested in learning. Oh, cert certainly. I would love to talk about this to, you know, to whoever is interested in, uh, in, the, in on this topic. Yes. How we, how do we in incorporate these kind of mechanistic model with machine learning? Um, yeah. Great. And, and, and then sort of the last thing, like, um, you know, so, so uh, I was just wondering if you could give us a sense also of, of kind of the future vision of what such machine learning methods might enable. Uh, I mean, um, you know, one one uh, thing I could imagine, I guess, is the ability to design or redesign the shapes of of tissues and organisms. And and can you tell me a little bit of, about that, or or sort of what what the long term implications of success uh, uh, of this type of machine learning method might might be? Yeah, I mean, it's super exciting to think about it. It almost is a little bit intimidating, Greg. So I really cannot predict <laughs> what's going to happen in the field, right? It's such a fast developing, uh, evolving field. Uh, but I think, you know, well, as development biology or system development biologists, we often think these genetic interactions as circuits, right? So I feel one way well, machine learning great. could help us I is to be able to maybe better understand or design circuits uh, that can perform specific functions. Um, like biological system, like, you know, the diffusion, the patterning is one thing, right? But for example, how do the cells interpret these gradients into discrete cell fates, right? And we have very few real biological system, people actually painstakingly dissect these genetic circuits, put these, uh, you know, maps together, right? But I wonder if machine learning can help us to say, well, um, to learn, you know, what are the possible ways <laughs> to create uh, these different patterns, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, shapes are harder, <laughs> just because I think the based on from the fun, uh, perspective of fundamental understanding, I think we don't really quite understand the shape as well, because then there's also more complicated things going on, like cell growth, proliferation, migration, which cannot be captured by these simple static, you know, discrete ODE model, PDE models. So um, I think that's, that requires a whole other types of modeling to be incorporated uh, into uh, the machine learning aspect. Yeah. Got it. Uh, and, and so what, what's, um, uh, I guess, what would be the um, ultimate impact um, also in terms of uh, medicine or in terms of um, uh, tissue engineering or, or, or this sort of thing? I mean, do you see this work as um, uh, purely pure biology or are you also thinking a little bit about what um, uh, the, the ultimate impact on human health um, oh, might yeah. be? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, so far what we built is kind of a toy model uh, in terms of understanding basic biology and these circuits, right? But I think uh, some of these uh, uh, labs who train are more like engineers, um, they st already start to adopt this mentality, trying to program cells uh, in a multicellular system. So, you know, you can control uh, cell differentiation uh, in a more spatially, uh, um, defined way instead of relying on the just like, you know, cell spontaneous differentiation, right? So it's more like guided by some sort of uh, principle or modeling uh, to induce uh, sort of the, the spatial patterns. Uh, we haven't done much on this yet, and I think it's a very exciting field. Um, but sure, yeah, I think, you know, compared to conventional tissue engineering, for example, you build a scaffold, you play the cells on top, right? I think this type of self-organizing behavior occurs at a very different length scale. Like everything we study is within 200, 300 micron, which is kind of the, the, the resolution limit for those traditional uh, uh, tissue engineering approaches. So I think there's definitely a very unique niche here uh, using synthetic biology to program tissue patterning for, you know, engineering or regenerative medicine. Yeah. Great. All right. Th thank you so much again uh, for a beautiful talk.